Okay. That's about as many people as I expected. Apparently the other room, was the other room a little bit smaller, I guess? A little tad? Well, like you said, I'm Joseph Hall. Uh, I have been a, a programmer for some years. I started off doing tech support. Um, I got my big break into programming when uh, my thinks he's my brother, Jace, hired me one day because I had the same last name. Um, unfortunately, I uh, got laid off from that job pretty quick and uh, went through the next uh, couple years working for a variety of different companies and even a college, which will re remain nameless. But I did visit this campus in that process. Um, I got kind of uh, discouraged with the whole, the whole internet thing. It wasn't working out. So I took off and went to cooking school. You know, next logical step anyway, right? Um, as it turns out, cooks really don't make any money. Um, in fact, they make even less money in Utah than really anywhere else. When I was going to cooking school, I was uh, paying for things by stocking shelves at Walmart and uh, making the same, working at Walmart there and working it as, as a dishwasher there as I was with a baker with a degree when I got back. So I went back to the whole internet thing, which had fortunately stabilized by that point. Um, the question is, though, why did I go into cooking in the first place? What got me interested in it? You guys ever heard the phrase, the bachelor aisle? Think about the grocery store. What would be the bachelor aisle? What would be the aisle where the bachelors all buy their food? Frozen, Frozen foods, TV dinners. Especially for, you know, stereotypically people like us, because you know, you guys have heard, in fact, somebody's already asked me this uh, in this presentation, uh, there's, there's two types of people. People that live to cook or live to eat and people that eat to live, right? And traditionally, geeks have been the type of people who just, uh, they eat to live. Uh, they run and toss me in the microwave while code is compiling, right? Because that's the only time we can pull ourselves away from the shell or from Vim or from Emacs or whatever, right? Um, but as it turns out, I was the type of person that watched, uh, I actually didn't watch a whole lot of TV, and it was kind of funny, I got a satellite dish and didn't really watch it a whole lot. I was like 20 or something, living at home. All my siblings were watching my satellite dish for me, make sure I didn't miss anything. And they said, hey, you gotta watch this guy, this Emerald guy, he's funny. And that was back before Emerald was kind of phoning it in, so it actually was pretty entertaining to watch. But then after Emerald, Emerald was done, you know, I. If they didn't turn off the TV, I just left the room because, you know, whatever. I don't know who the next guy was, but he, he kind of looked boring. He's this guy with funny glasses and a funny haircut. And... But uh, one day my sister said, you know what? This guy's kind of funny. You should watch some of them. His name is Alton Brown. You guys heard of Alton Brown, anyone? Fewer people than I expected. Alton Brown is kind of interesting. He didn't start off as cook either. He started off as a, uh, a film major. He was working in Atlanta doing corporate films, doing commercials. He actually was the uh, director of photography for REM's Losing My Religion video. Anyone know that? That means he's the camera guy, but they gave him a fancy name, right? But uh, as it turns out, in his spare time, he was watching cooking shows and complaining about how boring and uninformative they were. Anyone seen a cooking show that's boring and uninformative? Most of them. Anyone seen a cooking show? Yeah, same hands, right? So his wife finally got tired of hearing him whine about it and said, you know what, you're going to do something about it. And they packed up, they moved, they sold everything, sold their house, sold most of their possessions, moved from Atlanta to uh, uh, Vermont, and he went to the New England Culinary Institute. And he was there for four years, and he got himself a bachelor's degree and you know, worked in restaurants for a little while, and then his wife came to him and said, okay, you're done cooking, time to start writing again. Uh, long story short, he got himself a show called Good Eats. It's on Food Network still. In fact, they're celebrating their uh, 10th anniversary tonight. Um, and I, I learned something when I was watching Good Eats. I discovered, in fact, the episode I was watching was a caffeine episode. It was about tea, uh, either tea or coffee. He was talking about caffeine in general, and I realized that, guess what? Cooking is like engineering. And engineering is just another name. You know, there's software engineering, right? Programming is another type of engineering. I realized that cooking and programming were the same thing. The only thing that was really different was syntax. And then I got excited about it. In fact, this brings me to my first point. Cooking is an analog programming language. 
You ever thought about that? What do I mean by analog? That means, well, it's kind of sort of there, but you know, if you if you create multiple iterations and you know copies of copies and it kind of degrades a little bit, it's like chefs stealing another chef's recipe. They're going to change it a little bit, you know, in intentionally or otherwise, uh, and eventually it's going to kind of end up as a different product that kind of sort of looks like the same thing, right? Did you guys know there's actually a? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and call it a digital version of cooking. We call it baking. Uh, if you guys ever talk to bakers, like hardcore bakers, they're intense. They don't have recipes. They have formulas. I kid you not, that's what they call them in the bakery, is a formula. And they don't use measuring cups because measuring cups aren't accurate. They use scales. They weigh things. Because as it turns out, a cup of sifted flour weighs something different than a cup of packed flour, right? But if we weigh our flour beforehand, then we know we're going to get exactly the same amount of flour. So baking is more of a digital programming language, but cooking is an analog programming language. Alton Brown, uh, when he came out with his first book, said, food plus heat equals cooking. Look, he's already brought it into engineering for us. He's put it into a, a formula, a basic cooking formula, that tells us you know, how cooking works in general, right? If you take food and you add heat to it, then it's called cooking. What happens if you take food and you don't, you don't add heat to it? What's that? It's raw food, sushi. There's still some tasty things we can get out of it, but it's not technically cooking, right? But it still kind of gives us the basis for you know, object-oriented cooking. We know that there's formulas in there. In fact, recipe is code, right? Ingredients, when it comes down to it, they're modules. What is a module anyway? A module is just a piece of code that somebody's written beforehand. It could be you, it could be somebody else. And they've taken that and they've turned it into you know, reuse reusable code that we can use somewhere later on, right? In fact, somebody else may have done this module here and then we take it, we put it in our code, and we do our own special thing with it, right? Directions are a script. Um, back when I used to teach, I used to teach people about you know, shell scripting. And I'd say to them, Anyone here read Shakespeare? And nobody would read their, raise their hands because, you know, who cares these days about Shakespeare, right? But Shakespeare, thank you. Thank you, guys. Shakespeare wrote scripts, right? And a script wasn't just a story. It was a set of directions. It was, it was a set of procedures for, okay, first this guy is going to stand here, then he's going to say this, then he's going to go over here, and he's going to say this. He might have some flourish or something. The individual actors are going to put their own spin on it, but really, that's what a script is. It's a set of directions. And so when you look at a recipe, you have a script. Uh, it's really just a piece of code, right? But as with all pieces of code, there's some really well-written code and some really poorly written code, right? Any Perl programmers in here? How many of you guys have seen some really well-written Perl code? How many of you guys have seen some really crappy Perl code? Wow. More people raise their hands for seeing crappy Perl code than for those that raise their hands for being Perl programmers. You know, Perl is, I think this may be one reason that I got into Perl in the first place. Perl is really, really flexible, as cooking is really, really flexible. It gives you the opportunity to come up with some really, really great stuff or some really, really bad stuff, right? And unfortunately, and we see that a lot in our everyday life, uh, that flexibility for making bad stuff, bad but easy stuff, that's kind of prominent, isn't it? Uh, I was watching a show the other day on Travel Channel. They're talking about uh, uh, Sardinia, where the people there actually see going to restaurants as a personality flaw. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, my last point in there, oven temps, guess what? It's a compiler flag, right? Just another little tie in there. So, can we see that all? Going along with, along with Perl and cooking, I wanted to show you guys what a peanut butter and jelly sandwich would look like if it were written in Perl. I'm kind of proud about that because if somebody actually wrote modules for peanut butter, jelly, and bread, this would actually run. That's syntactically correct, isn't it? Did I mention that Perl is a very flexible language? That kind of gives us, what's that? Bread gets slices. Bread gets slices? Well, you're talking about dough first. We've already got the bread. It's already been baked. 
I guess the module that Brad could call would be the, the dough one, right? Is that what you're talking about? Okay, I'm with you. Subclassing. Subclassing and cooking. So peanut butter and jelly, right? It really is object-oriented code. Okay, somebody's created the bread for us beforehand, unless, you know, we bake our own bread. Anyone here bake their own bread on a regular basis? On a regular basis? Awesome. Who makes their own uh, jelly on a regular basis? Peanut butter? Kind of? Anyone ever made peanut butter before? Okay. Just not on a regular basis, right? So we can make those modules ourselves. We can go to somebody else's make make those modules. Anyone here that really likes to make their own modules just because they're more comfortable with them than using somebody else's module? A couple people, yeah. And a lot of cooks are like that too. They, uh, they're they not happy with the, uh, the module that's already out there, with the ingredient that's already there. And so they decide to just take it upon themselves to do it themselves. Sometimes they just kind of give up because it's too much effort. And sometimes they say, wow, this is way better and it wasn't that hard to do. I'm just going to keep on doing it like that, right? Modules are nice because you know, can you imagine if every time you wanted one single peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you had to bake a loaf of bread, you had to make a batch of jelly, you had to make a batch of peanut butter? It's ridiculous, right? We bake all our bread beforehand or we buy our bread beforehand. Same thing with peanut butter, same thing with jelly, right? It's just, it's code reuse, right? Um, I think it's all I want to say about that. Questions on anything so far? You guys are welcome to ask me questions at any point throughout the, the the lecture, conversation, whatever, the discussion. So, who's heard of Bobby Flay? Who likes Bobby Flay? Not as many hands? My family hates Bobby Flay, but it turns out they really like his food. The guy can cook. And at some point, he, uh, I heard him made a, make a statement that to really understand an ingredient, you need to understand what that ingredient tastes like by itself. Who here has tasted raw chicken by itself? Really? I had a chef in school that routinely would taste raw chicken, raw ground chicken, just to make sure it was seasoned right. The, the rule that he told us was if you want to you know, take chicken, ground it up, you know, cook off just a little piece, just enough to cook it all the way through, and then taste it to see if it's seasoned right, uh -uh. he just fork or spoon, more salt, and walk away, right? The guy had an iron stomach. They were, he was the butchery teacher, so I guess he kind of had to anyway. Um, the idea, though, is when you understand the underlying code beneath it, it's going to help you out a lot, right? When you understand you know, how cheese is made, it's going to help you a lot more use that cheese. But really, do you need to understand how cheese is made? Who here understands how cheese is made? Not everyone, right? But who likes cheese? Almost everyone, right? We don't need to understand how it's made to like cheese, right? But we can kind of do amazing things when we kind of get that underlying process. But it's not really a strict requirement. Um, one thing that uh, I can't emphasize enough is, you know, have you ever had, you know, gone to a restaurant or somebody, something and said, you know, that's just, that's missing something. You go over to somebody's house, you use something and say, you know, a little bit more salt, a little bit more this, you know, you get a olive garden, like Jace, he loves Olive Garden. <laughs> you know, you, you say, can I get more black pepper, more, you know, whatever, right? Uh, have you ever gone somewhere and said, you know what, that'd be really great without this, right? This burger would be really great without all those mushrooms. Right, Harley? You gotta understand that in order to make the perfect program or in order to cook the perfect dish, you need exactly as much code as is necessary, as many ingredients as, as are necessary, and no more, okay? There's a limit, right? A lot of people just try to, anyone watch Top Chef or Next Iron Chef or any of that stuff? And they, sometimes the judges complain about, you know, you, you put too much in there or you didn't put enough in there. You need exactly the right amount, no more, no less, right? Are we going to get it right the first time? No, not everyone gets it right the first time. Alton Brown sure doesn't. Alton Brown goes through a QA process just like we do. Well, like we should. <laughs> right? He actually, Alton Brown will take a recipe and say, okay, what is lasagna? 
What is lasagna? Lasagna is alternating layers of noodles, sauce, and cheese. And sometimes the sauce has meat in it, sometimes it doesn't. Is that a pretty accurate description of what lasagna is? Then they'll say, okay, how do I accomplish lasagna? Now that I've got it broken down to this one base concept, how do I make lasagna? Now, how do I make it the best possible? Of course, the best lasagna is going to have the best noodles, right? But guess what? He's got a half-hour show. He's not Thomas Keller. He's not going to teach you how to, you know, an entire lasagna episode do everything from scratch, though he'll actually refer you to, uh, refer you to other episodes. He's like, you know, if you want lasagna noodles, go back to my, you know, other episode about pasta, about pouch pasta, and, right? So we come up with the perfect pasta, we come up with the perfect sauce, he'll refer you back to the red sauce episode, come up with the perfect cheese, well, I don't think he has a cheese episode yet, but not cheese making at least. He has a cheese episode. And he'll say, okay, now that we have all these perfect ingredients, we've brought them up, to, you know, we put them together, we make a lasagna, we bake it at this time, right? Kind of reverse engineers that himself. Uh, there's a lot of common modules that we come across, both in code and in cooking. Uh, I bring up C because, anyone here a C programmer? Okay, who here knows C? Not everyone, right? Who here is a programmer at all? Other than C programmers? There's still a couple, right? The reason I bring up C, not everyone knows C, I certainly don't know C, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like Keith Richards, okay? It's been around since the 60s, it is the definition of a rock star in its arena, right? And it's never going to die. <laughs> Just like Keith Richards. With C or Keith Richards? <laughs> I'm going to make that statement for Keith Richards, too. So, but in C, we have stdio.h that's commonly included, right? A lot of code is going to require that just so it can get standard input and output. Not every code, but a lot of code, right? Uh, Perl, the single bi biggest module that I use in Perl is strict because it helps keep me honest, right? When you see code that's written without using strict, it tends to, not always, but tends to be a little bit more shabby, right? So it's a really, really common module. Programmers have their other favorite modules to use. I know some people that prefer to use uh, in Perl uh, LWP and some people that would prefer to use uh, Mechanize, you know, if they're writing a web crawler or something. And in cooking, we have the same kind of type of thing going on. Cooks have their own favorite modules. Uh, my favorite modules tend to you know, gravitate towards the southwest of America. I love spicy food. I love chilies. I hate Tex-Mex, which is a type of southwest. I actually don't like Mexican food all that much. But I love southwestern food. I love southern food, except for the green parts. I don't like that so much. I have this thing with kale and cooked spinach, and I don't get it. What's it? Oh, I hate okra. I don't like collard greens much either. Sorry, man. That's why I'm more of a Southwest cook than a Southern cook, right? Because, anyway. Uh, I also really like Italian food. Uh, I don't really care for a whole lot of authentic Italian food because, well, I'm not Italian. I've never been to Italy. I've never really experienced authentic Italian. I really have no way to figure out what authentic Italian is like. But I know what I like, and that's pretty much good enough for me, right? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, screw authenticity. Make what you like. That's really important, right? If you make something that's really, really tasty, I made a lasagna a while ago, brought it to work, and everyone said, wow, that's really good. And the one guy that had been to Italy said, you know, that's not too authentic, though. You used Worcestershire sauce in your... Well, yeah, I did, because it's tasty. <laughs> I don't care if they don't have it in Italy, it was tasty, right? Um, Bobby Flay is also another big uh, Southwestern chef. Uh, Mario Batali, big Italian chef. My Wolfgang Puck. You guys know Wolfgang Puck? Lots of people know Wolfgang, right? You know what his style of cooking is? What? <laughs> Commercial? This guy literally invented California regional cuisine. Hawaiian pizza, pineapple and Canadian bacon, that's I'm gonna, I was about to say that's his fault. That's not quite his fault, but it's close to his fault. You guys heard of California Pizza Kitchen? There was a guy, not a cook, no formal training, anything like that, but he really liked pizza, and he would just put whatever on it because it tasted good. He didn't care how authentic it was. 
he thought that Canadian bacon and pineapple went really well together on pizza, and so he did it. And he got a job with Wolfgang Puck, and he started making pizza for, pizzas for Wolfgang Puck, but guess who owned the restaurant, and guess who got the credit? And then he did that for, you know, five, ten years, and got bored with it, and took off, and, you know, these guys approached him a few years later and said, hey, we want to do a restaurant with the same type of pizza, right? And uh, he said, sure, why not? And they got together, and they founded California Pizza Kitchen. And it's very non-traditional pizza, right? Wolfgang Puck, he did some really non-traditional stuff, including pizza in California. That's the reason we have a lot of really nouveau food in California is because of Wolfgang Puck. He still has a lot of favorite modules he likes to use. Most chefs, at least in the Western world, are based in French cooking, and that's a really big module, right? In fact, I think that may be my next slide. Some of the common modules we have there. Anyone know what mirepoix is? The Holy Trinity, has anyone, anyone heard, ever heard of that in reference to cooking? So mirepoix is, and you love this, it's another formula, a two to one to one ratio of onions to carrots to celery. That's all mirepoix is. And in New Orleans, they take it and they take out the carrots and put in uh, green bell peppers. And they call that the Trinity or the Holy Trinity, right? It's a very, very common module in cooking. Uh, in fact, most red sauces that you see, most mirepoix, uh, uh, help me out. Marinara sauce, thank you, are based on mirepoix. They put that in the pan first with some butter. They start cooking it up. Maybe they add in some flour, right? And they make, uh, if they add in the flour to the uh, mirepoix while it's cooking, it's called a compound roux. If it's just butter and flour, it's called a roux, right? Anyone here ever worked with a roux? A few of you people have. In New Orleans, they use what they call a, uh, a roux, a roux uh, noisette, which is a black roux, which means it's just shy of being burned. It's not quite burned, but there's a very, very, very thin line, right? Roux is a very, very common French ingredient because it helps thicken sauces, and sauces are a big part of French cooking. So that's also another common module. Uh, stock and broth. They actually have another word for it in, in French. They call it fond. It means a base or foundation, right? What stock is, is we take some mirepoix, we take uh, uh, some cold water or some sort of flavorful liquid. We take uh, some aromatics. Uh, and we take some sort of nourishing element, like chicken or vegetables or beef or whatever. And we put it together and we simmer it for a little while. And then we strain everything out. And we've got this really flavorful liquid that it actually doesn't have a whole lot of flavor for you to taste it like that. Because you notice I didn't say salt. It actually tastes kind of gross on, it, on its own. And it doesn't keep very long because well, it's, it's not very acidic, it doesn't have any salt in it, it doesn't have anything to, you know, you can only keep it in the fridge for a couple days unless you start salting it. But then they've got this foundation they use for, uh, for cooking chicken, and, you know, for poaching, or for making, a, uh, help me out, salt, brine, for making a brine. I look to Jace a lot, because every time I say something about cooking, he has something to say about it. Um, it's a foundation for a lot of foods in there. It's a foundation for, well, sauces. You put fond together with a roux and you get, you know, a rudimentary sauce, but you, you get a sauce nonetheless. In fact, sauces are my next thing. The French have five mother sauces they use, or six or four or seven, depending on which cooking school you subscribe to. Uh, they have a hollandaise, which is, it's a mayonnaise, except it's heated when it's cooking. You, you guys know that mayonnaise isn't cooked? Does that scare you? It's got raw eggs in it. It's emulsified. It's usually pasteurized, so it's, it's usually safe, right? But, uh, you know, that's all a hollandaise is. It's just mayonnaise that's been cooked and has a little bit more spice in it, right? Far more tasty, though. Uh, we have a, uh, they call it a French tomato sauce, which is a really, really thin marinara. It's not chunky at all. It's very liquid. They've got five different mother sauces, depending on what school you subscribe to. And those are all really base modules that you see a lot in, in traditional French cooking and kind of leaching into other areas of cooking as well. Now, finding your own modules to cook with. Obviously, you don't need to be a chef. There's some really, really great cooks out there, home cooks, that just have found a favorite thing that they like to cook with, and they kind of stick with it because they're comfortable with it. Uh, maybe they do simple things. Maybe it's not that great. Maybe it's really, really amazing, right? But people kind of get comfortable with their own pieces of code um, and, and kind of get comfortable in using that in most, if not all, the dishes. Guess what? I use Worcestershire sauce in dang near everything but my Cheerios. 
I think Worcestershire sauce is awesome. You should try it in Cheerios sometime. You guys know what Worcestershire sauce is? What? If you did what? Chex Mix with Cheerios. Yeah, you could get away with that because Chex Mix has Worcestershire sauce, right? And Worcestershire sauce is just rotten fish sauce. Did I just ruin it for anyone? It's still dang tasty. Just not on its own. Have you guys ever seen uh, Thai fish sauce? You would never want to even a drop on its own. Oh, just gross. But it's, it's a really great seasoning, right? Um, you do need to kind of figure out what you like, though. Now, who here goes to McDonald's every day, Harley? <laughs> right. Oh, I believe you. Um, a lot of people here, they just they get stuck in a rut. They, kinda, they go to McDonald's. They, they go home. They have their mac and cheese. You know, they, they have a few different foods that they eat, but they're the same foods that they've been eating since they're, you know, being fed out of a jar, right? Um, not a bad idea to go out there at some point and see what other programmers are doing or other cooks are doing and kind of experience some of the other modules that are in play, right? I really love Indian food. I'm a big fan of Indian food. And I don't really cook a whole lot of Indian food, um, mostly because I'm really not that good at it. I'm better at Southwestern food. But I've seen some Indian stuff you know, kind of creep into my Southwest cooking sometimes. Uh, I came up with the recipe uh, concept at one point for uh, it was a chicken tikka masala in uh, uh, oh shoot, tamales, chicken tikka uh, tamales. Doesn't that sound good? That'd be awesome. Is it authentic? Who cares? As long as, as it tastes good, right? What's that? A tamale filled with awesome. Primary ingredient is awesome. So you got to know what you like. And it helps to go out there and, and try other new things. You know what? If you go to some restaurant that you know, maybe you, you think you're going to hate Chinese food, you're going to hate Thai food or something, go anyway. And if you hate it, well, you just learned anyway. Is it worth the risk? I think so. Even if you're just going to stop by McDonald's on the way home and grab something else anyway. I went to, uh, one day I went to a raw foods class down in Springville. And uh, it was actually more of a hallelujah session because everyone was talking about how great raw foods were. I was expecting people to stand up any moment and say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah, brother! Raw foods! I stopped by Carl's Jr. on the way home. Because I was still hungry, and I wasn't too keen on it by that point. Now, important things to remember about using recipes. In a, uh, in a restaurant, the recipe is gospel, okay? You guys see uh, ratatouille? They talk about this in ratatouille, right? You need to cook exactly what the recipe says because that's what not only the chef is expecting, that's what the customer is expecting. Can you imagine if you went to a restaurant with your buddy and you ordered exactly the same thing and one person got a really hot and spicy version that took up two plates and the other one got half a plate full of a really mild version? Would you feel rip, ripped off? Well, it depends on whether you got the two plates or the half plate, right? But the other guy would feel ripped off. So it's really important in a restaurant to follow the recipe because you want consistency, right? When you're actually serving to people that are paying you money, you want to be consistent in the way you, that you serve everyone, or else people are going to complain. It just it gets bad, right? But at home, we've got a lot of freedom, right? Uh, I know a lot of people that experiment a lot on their families. They use their family as guinea pigs a lot, right, Jace? And uh, you know, that's good. I highly encourage that. Uh, sometimes my wife encourages it, sometimes she doesn't. We find out usually, we're, usually afterwards, right? Uh, one of the things that I kind of do, though, is uh, I look at cooking magazines a lot. You know, I stop by the store, I look at, you know, Cook's Illustrated, I look at whatever, I look at the photos and say, wow, that looks good, but I never look at the recipe, or almost never, because I don't really care how they make it, they did it wrong anyway. Sorry, they did. I don't care if it's their recipe, they did it wrong. I'm going to do it my way anyway. The few times that I try to follow a recipe, and I'm not in a you know, professional kitchen, um, I'm just doing whatever it is that I'm going to do to the recipe anyway. Well, they didn't say Worcestershire sauce, but guess what? <laughs> it's getting Worcestershire sauce because I like it. You know what? That would be really good with some cheese. Of course, what wouldn't be good with cheese, right? So find a recipe you like, kind of adapt it. Look at the recipe if you want. 
Uh, if you are going to be, a recipe, be doing a recipe, this is something in Italian cooking school. Whenever you make a recipe, read it all the way through before starting the recipe. Guess what I don't ever do? Look at the recipe in the first place, right? So, we're going to do some cooking. Um, I do want to emphasize a couple things on this. Um, actually, before I even start cooking, uh, I want to make sure you guys know that there's no food being served as part of the conference. I tell you that because my uh, certificate expired last year. And if I were charging money, that would be legal. However, if I just gave it to you, then it would be completely legal, right? Does that work? We're all friends here, right? There's no recording of this at all, or no, no. I also, I feel kind of bad that I had to kind of stop there with the slides. When I started writing the slides, you know, a week ago, what, a month after I submitted them, after I submitted the idea, I sat down and just started putting together slides and said, you know what, this looks good and this sounds good. And I basically kind of started going through a programmer's version of the same outline. You can go ahead and get it started, dude, that's fine. Just going through the, the, a programmer's version of the same outline that I've written and rewritten and rewritten, and I kind of stopped short. So if it felt like it kind of stopped short there, that's why. I didn't want to bore you guys with hours of talk, 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 blah, 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 and no food, right? Who, came, who here came to see the food? Right. So we'll do a little bit of cooking. Um, if you guys, you know, I do have enough material in there to fill a book. If you guys want to see the book, it's time to start emailing O'Reilly, right? Make sure you use names. Right. First things first, anyone cooking, cook with a ring on? I don't want to eat it if you do, okay? Put your ring in your pocket, put it someplace where nothing's going to happen. Wash your hands, or if you don't have that opportunity, wear some gloves, right? All right, Harley. I also tried to find Purell, but apparently they're all out. Purell? Purell? You guys ever seen Purell? Hand sanitizer? Yeah. The guy kind of laughed at me and said, yeah, we can barely keep that in stock. In fact, Purell is having a hard time making enough to meet demand. But gloves work too. So today, I know you guys, some of you guys might have been looking for big, fat, juicy burgers, but, well, I'm playing it really safe. And I'm making something that's not food plus heat. I'm going to do a salad. I'm going to do kind of a, uh, a personal size Greek salad. You guys ever seen, uh, you guys ever seen these things before? Anyone? Let me hold up the, the original ingredient here so you can kind of see what's going on. This here is a, uh, this is a Belgian endive. Okay? Belgian endive. This is actually an escarole plant. Exactly, exactly the same plant as escarole and radicchio. You guys ever seen radicchio? Big, or actually it looks like a little purple cabbage, right? Exactly the same plant. This one's grown underneath cover. No sunlight at all. Really, really strange techniques, but it's kind of cool because you break off a leaf there and now you've got a nice little serving vessel for a little personal sized salad. Isn't that beautiful? It's convenient, isn't it? Um, is Belgian endive particularly Greek? It, does, it wouldn't seem so by the name, right? It's certainly not all that traditional since, get this, they only figured out how to grow this stuff in the 1920s, I think. It's a really recent ingredient. And it's organic. Isn't that weird? I assume it's organic. Uh, not a whole lot of, lot of ingredients are going into this one. We've got some feta because, guess what? Everything is better with cheese, right? Yeah. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. We got here some, uh, you guys know what pimento is? Has anyone ever wondered what pimento is? It's roasted red pepper. Took all the mystery out, didn't I? It's just roasted red pepper, but man, it's tasty. And guess what? Look, if you look at these ingredients here, we've got some Kalamata olives, we have some sun-dried tomatoes in olive oil, we have our pimento, and we have some uh, artichokes, artichoke hearts, right? Every single one of those is a module. This cheese, guess what? It's a module. This uh, lettuce, well, this particular lettuce is kind of a module, right? Because they figured out less than 100 years ago how to even grow it in the first place. 
people could have grown up for, you know, millennia, but they, they didn't. They hadn't they had it figured out, right? So in a way, it's kind of a module, right? Even though it's just a single ingredient. Um, we also have here, we have here a cucumber. This one really, I guess you could kind of still get away with calling it a module, right? Because somebody had to grow it and there's a certain amount of code that went in there. We call that code agriculture. Man, this thing kind of sucks. There we go. So let's go ahead and, wow. I am messy, aren't I? Kick that up a notch. Bam. Oh, that's not open source? You know, I feel like calling Tensai up here to do this for me because I don't feel like dealing with it anymore. Do you mind? Gloves. Notice that? Gloves. He forgot the ring, but that's okay because he's got the gloves on. What's that? Just that mere act makes people laugh, doesn't it? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you know, maybe I should have laid out these ingredients as well before we started, but I didn't want to ruin the surprise. I guess it didn't matter since I already had those laid out. I did something else kind of interesting here too. I left this morning, I got here, you know, I had a bunch of equipment with me, and I thought, okay, what did I forget? This may be something I should have thought of last night, right? What am I going to be forgetting? And as it turns out, a paring knife or a, a vegetable peeler was one of those items, and I had to pick up a really crappy one. Uh, something else that I didn't bring with me was olive oil. But guess what? These tomatoes came packed in olive oil. Isn't that convenient? In fact, I feel kind of bad sometimes when I, you know, I start a salad, I start something, Hey, thanks, man. I start something, and uh, I add olive oil. I do all this, all this other stuff, and I take some other ingredient out and realize I've got a ton of excess olive oil. Should use that, right? Helps the environment, all that fun stuff. Let's go ahead and start off by getting our cucumber ready here. Anyone here like the seeds? Do you? I'm going to show you guys how to take them out. It's not that I really care one way or another. They are a little bit more acidic, so a little bit more likely to give you heartburn. You kind of cut it into corners like this. and uh, Did I say corners? I meant quarters. There we go. And kind of cut away the inside like that. You see what we've got there? It's a great technique that works for, gosh, apples, cucumbers, pineapple. Be surprised. I'm being really sloppy here. They're never going to hire me now. Okay, I'll just kind of split that down the middle, each one of those. Take that, get us all chopped up. There's a lot of cucumber here in here. I'm not even going to use all of it. Well, maybe I will. We'll see. Uh, it does now. I use the analog flag. You're right, there's no Worcestershire. That's a problem. Somebody want to run and grab that in the next five minutes? That'd be great. If you could do that, that'd be great. Okay, a few olives here. Has anyone gotten into the, the hierarchy of you know all the fine olives and everything, or do they just there's the green ones and the black ones? There's the green ones and the black ones, right? And all the chefs will tell you the black ones are disgusting and about you know, who cares? But these ones, these are Kalamot olives. They are nice. Um, they sell them at Harmons. In fact, I got everything here at Harmons this afternoon. So you can find them in different places. I did not find the Belgian endive at uh, Smith's or anything, though. So 
Don't bother looking there. Just note for that part. Uh, what else do I have? We have, I'll do artichoke hearts next. Anyone here ever had artichoke hearts? Not a whole lot of people. The problem with artichokes is they actually come from a, a thistle plant. Um, most of the plant is, a large number of the plant is actually poisonous. In fact, there's this choke right in the middle of it that yeah, it got its name for a reason. Right? That looks like garlic. Looks like we got a little bit of garlic in there too. Kind of dice that up. Dice up our artichokes. Right? You guys will try out the artichokes when you get the salad. It's good stuff. It really is. Kind of scared me when I was a kid, but you know, everything scared me when I was a kid. That looks gross. I think one of my problems was my parents, when I was a kid, they, uh, they served us lechoy, or at least they tried to on a, a number of occasions, and that stuff is gross. I, I still, to this day, have this fear of Chinese food because I, they tried to feed me lechoy. It never really worked, but they tried. So I've got some sun-dried tomatoes here, packed in olive oil, makes them extra tasty. Bowl. There we go. And pimentos, they actually already came diced, so I don't need to worry about them, right? Easy salad. What do you think? We need, do we need more? We always need more. If I'm not careful, I'm going to be like Emerald. 40 cloves of garlic. Bam. So I'll add a little bit more of that in there. That might be a little bit uh, larger dice. And we take you know, our sun-dried tomatoes, toss that on in there. Take our, uh, our olives, toss those in there. It's bleeding through. Our tasty, tasty artichoke hearts. You guys that didn't raise your hand for having artichokes before, have you ever had spinach and artichoke dip at like Red Robin or anything? See, it's good stuff. And it's proof that even, even spinach can be tasty, even cooked spinach. Can be, isn't always, but can be. And uh, actually, I'm going to add the feta to last. Want a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of olive oil here. More, not for taste so much, but kind of keep things, kind of kind of gel it together. You know, marry the flavors, kind of help things uh, be a little bit moist, right? You don't want dry tasting food. And uh, yeah, that's looking good so far, isn't it? How's that look, guys? Tasty? We'll go ahead and add in our feta. How much? All of it? 40 cloves of garlic. Toss that up there. Man, that is going to be some tasty salad, isn't it? See how easy that recipe was? Do I still have a garbage bag up here, Tensai? This one over here? Oh, awesome. Thanks, man. So, we got some tasty, tasty food here. Plating is really easy. We've already got our leaves laid out, the tents I did for us, before uh, class started. Look at that. We just kind of spoon it in there. Tensai, you want to help me out here? And if you guys, you know, we're all friends here. You're welcome to try out my food. I'm not selling anything. I'm just saying you might like it. Right? Does anyone have any questions for me on this whole uh, object-oriented cooking thing? Yes? Earlier you talked about uh, having too much code, making it analogous to having too much of an ingredient. Do you think that would be more, of a, more appropriate for too many features in a, in a, rather than too many? Oh, too many features is you get bloated and you start getting buggy. And yeah, I see where you're getting. I see where you're going with that. Um, and it's not just too many of a single ingredient, it's too many ingredients in general, right? It's like, you know, peanut butter, jelly, and tuna. No. You don't need that much, and nobody's going to want it at that point. <laughs> just the peanut butter and tuna is fine, honestly, but the jelly. You know what? I hate seafood, so I'm not going to eat it anyway. Peanut butter, jelly, and banana is awesome, right? 
with chocolate sauce, deep fried. That Elvis guy, he actually knew what he was doing, right? Jace, did you have something? Yeah, so if you're saying you, know, you do, you learn French style cooking, you're a pearl programmer, maybe Southwest or Southwest overall. Right. If pearl equates to that, what do Python, Ruby, et cetera, equate to? <laughs> regional. Regional. Well, PHP is marshmallow cream. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. PHP is marshmallow cream. So the question is, for the cameras here, if Perl is French food or Southwestern food or whatever, then what are Python, Ruby, PHP, and so on? We've established that PHP is the marshmallow fluff. Python is churrasco. Python is churrasco. So Brazilian barbecue. Yeah. Jace, did I did I butcher that really really bad? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> what do we have left? Ruby. What's Ruby, guys? Any Ruby programmers? Sushi. Sushi? Yeah. Japanese. Oh. That's true. Java would be breakfast food. Any others in here? Let's see. Dot net. McDonald's. Cobol. What would Cobol be? I guess I. Lisp. That's a good one. What would Lisp be? Fusion? Something with a lot of parentheses. Is there any kind of food with a lot of parentheses? Parentheses, parentheses kind of look like corn chips, right? I was going to go for nachos. A head of lettuce? So lettuce wraps? I like that. Lisp is lettuce wraps. Excellent. We miss anything? Assembly. That's, that's wheat. That's hunter-gatherer, right? Haskell? Haskell. What? It? It's an acquired taste, so it wouldn't really be... Right. Oh, what programming language would Ludafisk be? Does anyone know what Ludafisk is? A what? It's a, core a core dump. I don't care what language. Should I say what Ludafisk is, or yeah. are people going to lose their appetite? Ludafisk is a white fish that's been cooked for several days in lye. And then they wash off the. What? Months? It, it literally turns into fish jelly. It's very popular in. Certain parts of Scandinavia, Minnesota, Seattle. Um, I have heard people say that you should try Ludafisk once and only once. I've also heard people say that it's best with lots of butter. Fair enough. I've also pe heard people say it's best with a lot of mustard. Anything to mask the flavor, really. You guys ever heard of hag haggis gravy? We've all heard of haggis, right? Haggis gravy, also known as whiskey, is what you put on the haggis because if you have enough haggis gravy, you don't care what it tastes like. <laughs> right? Okay, any other questions, guys? Awesome. I uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Clint. Um, everyone but you. Okay, you can have some. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.